Alright guys, welcome back to the channel. If you're new, my name is Bobby. Guys, super fascinating video today. We're gonna react to former Muslim, allegedly, explains Trinity and why he became a Christian. So this is something that I'm really looking forward to, of course, wink, wink, because no Christian, no Christian scholar, no priest, not even the Pope, could truly explain the Trinity, but this former Muslim today surely will. All right, let's find out. But before we do so, guys, if you enjoy my content, leave me a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and check out the links in the description box below to further support my work. And now, with no further ado, let's have a look. Sometimes we say, Mom, I'm going to see you tomorrow. Hang on a minute. How do you know that? You can only say that by faith. So remember, give and put your faith in Jesus Christ. And God bless you guys. Amen. God bless you. <laughs> <laughs> weakest argument ever yeah so this is how the video starts i'm saying it's a weak argument to leave islam because he made the claim that you have to have faith when you make a statement about tomorrow and that is correct yes and this is why in islam we say inshallah yeah. i just want to encourage everyone yeah. i want to say to you i don't know if they're on the live yeah. i want to say to you look i've been having i've been having such a tough week fleshly sinfully like it just been very difficult in the flesh and carnally and i was stressing <laughs> not really wanting to spend time with god but just so like dominated by the things of like studying and and i realized man god you made me to know you to do the things of you and like it's so much joy that never feel condemned never feel you're unqualified yes we are not qualified for Jesus, but he called us, so now we are qualified. There is nothing that you can do to separate you from God and his love. So the only thing I can tell you is, don't stop your circumstances from serving God. Okay, bro, the guy seems very Jesus mentally once, disturbed, to be honest. Joy. Man, I have so much joy. When I go home, I can be like, man, I'm just going to do my study. It is so much joy. I'm just going to do this, not worry in Christ. You have no worry, you have no condemnation, you have no guilt, you have no shame. He is the one, Jesus says in Matthew 11. Yeah, so as I said, he seems very mentally disturbed. And I'm not saying this to insult him or anything, I'm just pointing out the obvious, I believe. Because people that have to repeat, you don't feel shame, you don't feel guilt, I am so happy, 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 usually are not. He is the one, Jesus says in Matthew 11, 28. He said, those who labor and are hard laboring, come to me. Give you rest. So come to him. And then he says, What? Take my yoke. Yeah, okay. So he says, You have to go to Jesus, and Jesus in Christianity means God to find rest. Well, in Islam, we find who have believed and whose hearts have rest in the remembrance of Allah. Verily, in the remembrance of Allah do hearts find rest. So as expected, he doesn't give any logical or rational proof for why Christianity is true and Islam is not. He simply says that within the Bible he read that you would find peace or rest or whatnot in Jesus Christ. In Christianity, as I said already, Jesus Christ supposedly is God and Islam teaches exactly the same, that in the remembrance of God you will find rest. Upon you, right? And take it upon you. That means join with Jesus. Let that burden be as well on him, that he can carry it with you. And he said, my yoke is easy, man. All you have to do is go by faith. That's how easy it is, that you just go to Jesus. And my burden is light. It is no longer a burden. He can carry any burden in the world and it's still light. So God bless you guys. If any of you are feeling like that, I want to tell you, he is for you. He is with you. Speak the name of Jesus. Even if it's five minutes, even if it's 10 minutes, even if it's 20 minutes, acknowledge him. And you will know what it is to know the Father. He understands you. And God bless you. Amen. Okay. So know the Father or know Jesus? That's always the question ultimately, right? They mention the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Supposedly they're all one, but they end up worshipping Jesus and not really understanding the Father whatsoever. To hear, to hear. One, one question from some uh, from the Muslim channels. Do Christians believe there are three gods? <coughs> no. So I want to clear that misconception. Christians, I used to clear think up. they used to believe three gods, but they believe in one God. And the Bible says in Old Testament, our Lord, our God is one. And then in the New Testament, it says there is only one true God. 
and that that word that word who is yeah, God came to wait yeah Christians just love to throw around passages without reading them fully and without understanding what their own Bible actually claims so here we can see the passage that he actually quoted he said so that they know you the only true God and he infers then that this must be Jesus but here we read in John 17 3 Jesus himself speaks and says now this is eternal life that they know you the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So it is blatantly obvious that the Father is addressed here as the only true God and, and separation, Jesus Christ whom you, the Father, have sent. So who is the only true God according to the Bible? It is the Father <laughs> and the Father is the one that sent Jesus Christ. But who is God came in the flesh. Keep on yapping. So that he was already God and it said Jesus Christ was already, it says a scripture in the book of John, that the glory that I had with you Father from the beginning of the earth and be even before the world began, Jesus was there. But just because Jesus came in the flesh now. It okay, wait. So let's just take his argument here and confirm. Let's say, yes, Jesus was there before the creation of the earth. So what? That would only make Jesus an earlier creation. Because here in John, you surely know, but you don't want to tell your audience, the Father sends Jesus. And the Father is the only true God. So therefore, claiming that Jesus was prior to the creation of the earth wouldn't make any difference whatsoever. I mean, oh no, he's separated from God. No, he's the expressed image of God. He was always there. Everything was made through him and by him. So he always... Okay, according to Christianity, we are all created in the image of God. And therefore, no matter where you look, you see the image of God in men. You wouldn't need Jesus for that. So he always was in the Godhead. Holy Spirit, Jesus, the Father, are one God in nature. One essence as God. But they yeah, one essence, not in nature. Because according to Orthodox Christianity, Jesus Christ had two natures, the human nature and the godly nature. Therefore, he was fully man and fully God. So this alone already tells you that the son then would be different than the father because the father doesn't have a human nature. But we're supposed to believe that they're all co-equal and they're just ultimately the same God. Yeah, sure. Positions. The Father in authority in heavens. Jesus Christ dying on the cross, being the Lamb of God. Holy Spirit being in us. You see, all of that is God as a whole. God so is God. one divine nature, three different persons. I'm going to give you one last example. That's not even Christian. Yeah, what the guy claims here is not Christian whatsoever. He just makes it up as he goes. And you see that quite often with Christians. They really have no idea what they're really talking about. This here is the Council of Chalcedon. So one of the early Christian councils where they essentially manufactured church Christianity. And here you can read, This teaching about Jesus Christ, the incarnate Son of God, was further elaborated and explained by the definition of the Fourth Ecumenical Council in Chalcedon, in 451. This was necessary because there was a tendency to stress the divine nature of Christ to such an extent that his true human nature was underplayed to the point almost of being rejected. So what this ultimately means is that they deified Jesus Christ as God alone, but ultimately the whole Christian doctrine is that he is fully God and fully men, whatever that means. At the Fourth Council, the well-known formulation, and that's why I always say they formulated Christianity, they had to come up with a new formula of what it actually means because they had no revelation, was made which says that Jesus Christ, the incarnate Son and Word of God, is one person, or hypostasis, having two full and complete natures, human and divine. And this, as I mentioned already, would of course make him very distinct of the Father, because the Father doesn't have a human nature. Inspired particularly by the letter of Saint Leo, the Pope of Rome, the Fourth Council insisted that Jesus is exactly what God the Father is in relation to his divinity. Which, yet again, doesn't make sense, because he cannot be that exactly, because he already has another nature than the Father. 
This was a direct reference to the Nicene Creed, which claims that the Son of God is of one essence with the Father, which simply means that what God the Father is, the Son is also. Light from light, true God from true God. And this is not something that you find in the Bible as such. This is the Nicene Creed, yet again another formulation of the Orthodox Catholic Church. And the Council insisted as well that in the Incarnation the Son of God became exactly what all human beings are, confessing that Jesus Christ is also of one essence with all human beings in respect to his humanity. So here you can see that Son, supposedly God, became something. He became human. And that would imply, of course, that God is not perfect if he has to become something. Allah in Islam is perfect. He always was perfect. He transcends time and space. Therefore, he doesn't have to come into space, become something in his own creation to be perfect, to be whole. But this God in Christianity has to. Anyways, I don't want to go into further detail here. It's not necessary in order to point out that the ex-Muslim there has absolutely no clue what he's talking about. I'm going to give you one last example. Imagine now, you are a father to your children. You are also a husband to your wife. And you are also a teacher by occupation. Does that make you now three different human beings? Oh my no, God. You're still one being for yeah. different positions. Okay, fantastic. You... Always the same example with the Christians. And it's such a bad example. It's unbelievable, really. So he says there, okay, you're one human being, but you are a father, you are a son, you are a teacher. Okay, man, but I'm still just one person. I don't have a multiple personality disorder, right? I'm a human being. Yes, I can be a father and I can be a son. Surely, because I actually do have a father and yes, I do have a son. Those are different people. We are three different people. But with your God, you are claiming that those three different people are actually one God but you still have to say that there are three persons. So your human example there is absolutely ridiculous. And of course, you go against the Bible because you should have no image of God in your mind. You shouldn't imagine God because you cannot imagine God. And moreover, you anthropomorphize God and I cannot blame you because you are a Christian. You always anthropomorphize God because you call him the Father, you call him the Son. You already have a very humanistic view of God. But ultimately, as I said already, your argument doesn't fly here because if we take myself, yes, I am a father and I am a son, that is due to different persons, different persons that are not only distinct from myself, but are actually not myself. But this is exactly the Christian claim. Serve the same way, even in your home. When you need to teach, you teach. When you need to be a father, you be a father. When you be a husband, you be a husband. But you still got the same nature, human nature. And that's why God, he still has the human nature. I hope that answers your question. No, it doesn't. It doesn't answer the question whatsoever. And you're wrong yet again, because which God has the human nature? As I already explained, the Father doesn't have the human nature. It is only the Son. This is already the biggest contradiction there is. But moreover, Christianity always lists the Father, the Son. How about the Mother? Right? How about the daughter? How about the sister? Why do you stop the relationship right there with a father that allegedly eternally begets one son and somehow they are the same? What you are saying there is not congruent with Christianity to begin with, let alone with logic. God and he'll reveal the truth. If he reveal the truth, like a stern Muslim like me, he can do it to you. God bless you. Amen. One other question is, I mean, he doesn't understand Christianity. Like, I don't like, think that he understood Muslim. Islam. What did that consist of? Like, they're asking, oh, was he a true Muslim? And then, um, what, what, why did you switch to Christianity following Jesus? Okay. I don't want to say this for too long, but I have love for all my Muslim family and friends. And, you know, there's no nothing personal against them. I love them, honestly. And uh, I have the same compassion for them. I want them to know the truth. Is that when I was a Muslim, the thing is, at the end of the day, everyone will point fingers. When someone leaves the belief system, whether you're Muslim, Hindu, atheist, vegan, whatever you are, and you leave it, they look at you differently now. They think, oh, you were never the true thing. But That's how can true. we make that judgment when we never knew their heart? My heart, I was never perfect. No man is perfect. 
but my heart was in the truth. I really did my best and I still had sin in me. But I tried my best and I served Allah. I did what I did as a Muslim. But no man behind the camera knows that. They don't need to know that. But I know my family knows that. My family is a testimony, is a witness to my life. That they know if you were to come to meet them, they will testify that how much he was a Muslim. But God, out of his goodness and his humor, took me out, one of the strictest ones. And I was the most resistant to Christianity. Look how God works. I didn't even want to talk to Christians. I didn't want to even believe even one moment, Jesus, Son of God. I had enough. I would be angry. And God humbly has showed me that the true God who answers is only Jesus. Yeah, okay, I can relate to the family resistance because I come from an Orthodox Christian background and I reverted to Islam, alhamdulillah. But ultimately, what would be really interesting here to hear is, of course, how he practiced Islam, how he understood Islam and why Christianity is the truth and Islam is not. When you hear Christian testimonies, you never hear rational facts. You never hear rational facts based on scripture or anything. They simply say that they prayed to Jesus and then suddenly they had some sort of spiritual experience, which is of course very subjective. We cannot prove that here, even if it were true. So therefore we are only left with anecdotes. And therefore, if you're already in the realm of anecdotes, I can give you an anecdote as well, if you will. So when I was an Orthodox Christian, when I returned to become very practicing, I was praying to Jesus on a daily basis. And I was praying to Jesus to reveal himself to me for three years straight and guess what i never saw jesus appearing whatsoever so therefore i changed my prayer and i actually asked god for guidance to really show me the truth and then ultimately alhamdulillah i found islam so there you go now you have another anecdote yet again but this is not what i use as an argument on why i became a muslim if i defend islam i defend islam based upon the scriptures and based on how islam was revealed especially in comparison to Christianity, of course. Because if you look into Christianity, as we did here briefly, you will see that they have many new conceptualization of what Jesus Christ's teachings were. And with new conceptualizations, I'm not talking about Protestantism or anything of those sorts. No, I'm talking about the earliest councils, which were roughly 400 years after Jesus Christ. And this is when they conceptualized Christianity the way that we know it nowadays. So it is so blatantly obvious that Christianity is not Jesus's religion. How come I was in Islam for all my life and I still never had peace? How come I was struggling with sin day in, day out? How come I never was able to overcome? Okay, this is absolutely ridiculous, man, because you started the video by saying that you were totally in the flesh and you were super struggling there. You couldn't focus on anything you were studying and whatnot. So you didn't overcome either now as a Christian. What are you talking about? How come I wasn't able to love my enemies? How come I couldn't walk in the power of God? What does and it how even mean? Come I had to live by rules with limitations. But when I come to Jesus, he showed me none of that is needed. Okay. Yeah, so he just keeps on yapping, of course, loving your enemies. And I agree with that. But what does it truly mean? If you look into the Bible, you will see that wars are being waged and people are being killed, right? This is the truth of the Bible. So loving your enemies in the modern day, in the modern context, people use it as if you have to be this pacifist, very benevolent, and oh, we just love each other. This is not what the Bible preaches at all. Loving your enemies in that context simply means that you return to the love of God, that you return to the truth of God, and therefore you do what is right. So therefore, if we say loving your enemies in a smaller context, for example, you are a diet YouTuber and now fat people will be your enemies, quote unquote, you can still love them enough to tell them the truth, that they are obese, that they are overweight and that they should diet in order to have a better outcome for them. So therefore, loving your enemies in Islam, we offer peace as well, right? And only if they decline and they attack you, then you should have a war, obviously. And it's the exact same principle in Christianity as well. So therefore, they simply take verses, love your enemies. What does it mean? Does it truly mean that you have to be in love, quote unquote, this emotional love that is propagated in the West nowadays, and you simply hug your enemies and get yourself killed? Of course not. 
It is about forgiveness. It is about ultimately seeking peace. But this love means to do the right thing. And you have the exact same concept within Islam. Relationship with God. Now, any enemy, I love them. Jews, I love them. Israel, I love them. You know, it doesn't matter what people have done. You still love them because that is the love of God. And it can only come through Jesus, my friends. Okay, One day, and what does it mean? So he mentioned Jews and Israel there, supposedly as his enemies. So what does it mean now? So now you love them. Now, how will you act? Will you do the right thing now? How will you defend the Palestinians, right? That becomes the question. So just saying, well, I love everybody. I want to see you in a war situation. And then I want to see how you will act out on your love. My friends do the gospel with me. I didn't believe him. But I examined my heart. I thought to myself, hang on a minute. I'm praying five times a day. I'm reading the Quran, doing all these things. But do I really have a relationship with God? I will ask you the same question, my friend. Do you have a relationship with God? If you do, yes, I do. you will hear his voice. You will follow him without limits. Okay, that's ridiculous. So if you look into the deepest practices of the Orthodox Christian monks or the Catholics, you will find ultimately certain spiritual experiences where people talk about the voiceless voice of God. So ultimately, it's like a revelation to the heart. But nobody, nobody of the true Christians will ever claim that they hear the voice of God. If you're hearing a voice in your head, that is not God. You will have his presence. He will speak to you. You will respond. You have an open ear. You know who he is. You love anyone that passes your way. No one can do anything for you to love them any less. Only then you know you're the true, you follow the true living God. The true living God can destroy you right now, but the fact that you've sinned against him so much and he's still alive, can you love someone the way he loves you? That's how I want to ask you the question. That's how Jesus, I know Jesus saved me. Now, my family, you know, they know. They know. Okay. Oh, yes. I'm going to cut it off here because it goes absolutely nowhere. Of course, he talks about the love of God in the end and how he sacrificed Jesus for you. And who loves you like that? Nobody does. This is the love of God. Christianity, if you really boil it down, you realize you are guilty for something that you haven't done. You're guilty for what Adam and Eve done in the garden, allegedly. And now how will you get salvation? through Jesus Christ that died for you. So you're being judged for something that you haven't done, and now you get redemption for something you haven't done yet again. So ultimately, what do you have to do in Christianity to be saved? Nothing, just believe. You see, and I totally understand why religion was called opium for the masses, essentially a tranquilizer for the masses, because this statement was based on Christianity, because it is really true. You simply give up responsibility. He said it himself. Why should I pray five times per day? Why should I read Quran? No, I'm just going to believe in Jesus. And that's all I have to do. And now the whole world is lovey-dovey, even though it is not based upon his own scripture. He simply chose what felt good to him. In the Quran, of course, we read, and I'm paraphrasing here, that there might be something that you love, but it's bad for you. And there might be something that you hate, but it's actually very good for you. But in this day and age, people simply do whatever feels right. And this is what he did as well. And therefore, ultimately, Allah guides who he wills. All right, guys, and this is it for today's video. If you liked it, leave the thumbs up, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, check out the links in the description box to further support my work. Thank you very much for that. And as always, may God bless you all. Much love and peace. <laughs>